The aim of this panel is to critically examine what agency means in terms of the role of museums and galleries in society and in serving their communities. The questions tackled from the viewpoint of us, us, Alex and me, as directors of the National Membership Associations, and also from cultural and community leaders from outside of this environment and mindset. So I'm going to just do an introduction first and talk a little bit about evidence and value. Uh, then Julian Mayrick from the uh, Flinders University. Sorry, I don't have, my notes are very, very poor, so I apologize for that. Um, is, is going to talk about cultural value. Andrew Turner, who's the Deputy Mayor of Christchurch, who had hoped to be here in person, but they're at the very final end of their long-term plan hearings. Uh, he was here earlier while the Minister was here, but he has recorded a video as well. Um, Terry Yanke, who is an Indigenous um, worker in Australia, but um, Alex will introduce her. Uh, Amiria Puya Taylor, who many of you will know from Auckland, who used to be at Auckland Museum and is now a full time people weaver. And then Alex will uh, conclude the panel session, and then we hope there will be plenty of time for discussion uh, afterwards. So the question Are museums agents of change? Well, over the last day and a half, we've heard an awful lot about that. This morning, Minister Cipolloni talked about museums and galleries and community. Uh, and the Prime Minister on Budget Day, one of her press releases uh, talking about the recognising the importance of our arts, culture and heritage. Uh, and amongst that, she said, there is increasing evidence of the many benefits of cultural participation in areas such as health and education, and of its value to social cohesion and community resilience. So we've got the buy-in, but we've also got a challenge. Yesterday, Tarmark Solomon really challenged us to take on some difficult topics. Uh, Sasha McMeekin, for instance, talked about museums and galleries having the human touch and the power to provoke either love or fear. And this morning we've had the repatriation challenge, which has healing power and can transform communities. So are we actually doing it? That's a very good question. When I was thinking about this, uh, this session and the agency of museums and galleries, uh, I thought back to my study of art history and anthropology. And it, one of the things that fascinated me about art was that at various points in history, it's either been there in support of the power structure that's, that's there. So think, you know, the Medici's uh, commissioning amazing artworks to cement their power, to, to show that they are there with, by the divine right of God, etc. Um, or Art can be an agonist, it can be a catalyst for change, it can be expression of the need for change. And I remember writing an essay on, on mural art in Poland and in Northern Ireland about the, the amazingly uh, accomplished artworks which were there in public places really making incredibly important points about the need for change. And similarly, the knowledge and the research in our institutions is part of scientific discovery and all sorts of other ways that we contribute to the possibility for change. So what point are we at now? Are we actually here in support of the status quo or are we, as some of those challenges we've heard over the last day and a half, are we here to make a change? And I hope that it will come through in this session that we really are needing to grasp that challenge and be agents of change. But we do tread a fairly fine line because that is difficult. Uh, we want to fulfil the expectations of our funders who generally are kind of risk averse and, uh, and don't want to rock the boat, don't want to be um, uh, putting things out there that, that are going to um, show them in a bad light. But we also need to fulfil the changing expectations of our visitors who are diverse and who uh, are involving communities and we need to be part of that and we need to invite them to be part of that. So it is a very tricky balance. Uh, 
what are we doing about it? As an institution, as an organisation, Museums Aotearoa is trying to support the evidence base for uh, museums and galleries and for what we do. We do a lot of surveying, a lot of data gathering. Um, many of you will have been harassed by us to fill in our surveys and give us information. And we do use that to good effect. We put it into, uh, into our press releases, we put it into a position paper for our new government, and we crunch those numbers and we produce reports. We produce the visitor uh, survey infographic, and we're just about to release this new report, which I have some coffee, copies of at the AGM later today, which is about uh, the benefits of museums, galleries, and heritage properties. We, we put that in the title because it, it actually looks at the um, Heritage New Zealand properties as well, so we've kind of made that a subcategory. And looking at how they're delivering benefits for individuals, so those are the people with whom we are working, but also for communities. Uh, so the very the intrinsic value that we provide just by being there uh, and creating value for New Zealand. And We've been couching this, in, and some of you will have seen some of the presentations we've given with lots of graphs and lots of, lots of numbers, um, but that's not necessarily accessible to all the people who we're trying to talk to. So we're trying to couch this in, in more accessible ways. Yes, we've still got graphs and numbers, there's, there's an awful lot in there, but we're also trying to build the narrative around what we do as museums and galleries, and make that more digestible, make that more useful for you as your own advocacy, but also for the people that we're talking to. Interestingly, we've been doing a lot of um, submissions lately to various long-term plans and councils. Uh, one of the councils was quoting in a, in a council officer written paper, was quoting from our 2014 survey and spouting those numbers. So it's really good to see that they are using that evidence. So we need to make sure that it is up to date and that it's relevant and that it's useful. Um, and that's probably enough from me. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, hand over to Alex to introduce Julian Mayrick, who's going to talk more about cultural value and about the research that goes into that. Very briefly, I'm going to introduce Julie Mayrick. You're going to hear him speak in a minute on video. Um, he's a strategic professor of creative arts at Flinders University, artistic counsel for the State Theatre Company of South Australia, and a member of both the Currency House and Chass boards. Chass is the uh, Council for Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, an advocacy organisation. He's directed many award-winning theatre productions and is chief investigator on two ARC projects, Oz Heritage and Laboratory Adelaide. As a historian, he's published books on the Nimrod Theatre and the Melbourne Theatre Company and numerous articles on Australian theatre and also on cultural policy. He's a founding member and deputy chair of Playwriting Australia 2004-09 and a member of the Federal Government's Creative Australia Advisory Group 2008 to 10. Now Julian is going to draw on his work on Laboratory Adelaide, which is an ARC, an Australian Research Council funded project. And that is developing an approach to the valuing of culture beyond economic dollar values, ticket sales and spillover effects. Julian, I have to say, writes also absolutely beautifully um, and brilliantly for the conversation. I don't know whether um, any of you read that, that um, um, website that comes out every day with fantastic articles. He's a superb advocate for culture and for cultural policy. He's a passionate person. You should probably get along to anything that you're trying to do um, with ministers or others. So um, I commend this video to you. Hello. My name is Julian Merrick. Alex and Philippa have asked me to talk about culture and value today. I'm part of a humanities-based research project at Flinders University, which has been looking at the problem of how arts and culture are evaluated, mainly by governments, but also by cultural organisations themselves. There's five of us in the core group and another three in the extended one. We all have different art form backgrounds, minds in the theatre. We have been researching and publishing in the area since 2014, and we have sophisticated views. 
These do not reflect the conventional wisdom that the only problem evaluating arts and culture faces today is that it doesn't have good enough methods, particularly quantitative methods, that if it could only measure what it was doing in the same way as box factories and brick kilns, then it could demonstrate its value perfectly well and all its problems would be over. Not only is this idea simplistic, it's also culpable. It doesn't allow for the fact that quantitative methods are limited, gameable, abusable and sometimes just plain daft. We've become obsessed as a society with measuring things as if this alone was going to say something about their meaning. The historian Jerry Muller, whose book The Tyranny of Metrics came out earlier this year, has coined the phrase metric fixation to describe the bind we've got ourselves into. He says, and I quote, the key components are the belief that it is possible and desirable to replace professional judgment acquired through personal experience and talent with numerical indicators of comparative performance based upon standardised data, and that the best way to motivate people is by attaching rewards and penalties to their measured performance. Muller goes through all the ways that numbers can misrepresent or manipulate what organisations and people do. Some of his examples will make your hair stand on end, like the surgeons who refuse to operate on desperately sick people because their possible deaths could lower their metric score. There is absolutely no doubt that the use of numerical information, which has been exponentially boosted by big data and digital analytics, is creating as many problems as it is solving and raising some fundamental ethical questions about the end use of results, as the recent Facebook scandal showed. But behind this is a more fundamental problem to do with value itself. The word, the idea, the human dimension involved in giving anything a place in our public life. I'm a cultural historian. My subject area is Australian culture in the post-war years, from 1945 to now. I can say with some authority that there has been a diminution in the concept of value over that time, especially in the last three decades. Value has become essentially dollar value, and the fit with Muller's metric fixation is a perfect one. My colleagues and I talk about whether as a society we are obsessed with money and therefore with counting it, or whether in fact it's the reverse, that we are obsessed with counting and money feeds our habit. Whichever is the case, the result is to strip away all nuance around the idea of value, to treat the context, meaning and purpose of activities that claim to have value as irrelevant, to regard discussion about context, meaning and purpose as special pleading, and routinely and repeatedly to demand evidence, typically quantitative data, to, su to support what the Productivity Commission likes to call a robust analytical approach. If the results aren't worthless, they are considerably less efficacious than claimed. It's domain ignorance dressed up as disinterested calculation. Numbers become the mark of that ignorance, the cult of the spreadsheet. Governments think they are measuring things definitively when all they're doing is parading the extent of their belief that things can be definitively measured. Culture is not an exception to this rubbish approach to evaluation. When my colleagues and I began our research, we thought, understandably, that for the problem of value, it was the nature of arts and culture that presented difficulties. The great diversity of the field, the intangible nature of cultural experience, the long-term uh, return on public investment, the complex relationship between artistic failure and popular success, the crucial but under-emphasised role of the history of cultural organisations. These factors, we thought, were the major complicating ones in renegotiating evaluative strategies that made sense to cultural practitioners and not just to Treasury officials juiced to the eyeballs on the economic dogma of Milton Friedman and Gary Becker. These qualities are a challenge to talk about, it's true. But there are other areas of life which struggle with corresponding problems. The environment, for example, and having to demonstrate the value of what are lamely called non-renewables. Or IT, where intellectual property, which is by definition intangible, places extraordinary demands on balance sheet thinking. Earlier this year, <clears throat> we held a symposium in Adelaide in which we gathered together people from many different backgrounds energy activists, environmentalists, scientists, philosophers, political economists, arts managers and artists. 
The clearest thing that emerged from our discussion, and believe me, it was absolutely unmissable, is that we're all in the same leaky boat, all struggling against a reductive mentality so profound that it numbs those who enters, enter it strategizing, be they politicians, policymakers, or practitioners in the field. The first step in addressing this situation is to admit that something has gone catastrophically wrong with our concept of value, particularly our concept of public value, and that this is why arts and culture struggle to prove their worth in the present moment, and not only because their features elude quantitative methodologies. Indeed, there is a great deal more to cultural experience than counting the bits of it that lend themselves to numerical scaling. But this fact should energise those who care about culture to point out the obvious, that culture isn't the problem, that if it doesn't fit our evaluation strategies, then we need to change the way we evaluate and not change culture to fit existing wonk strategies. The ambition of a different approach to the evaluation of arts and culture is not a pipe dream, it is a job of work. It is one my colleagues and I are very focused on at the moment. We are not alone in this either. Some of our best conversations in the last year have been with accountants. Some of the most interesting ways forward involve new reporting frameworks coming out of the corporate sector, such as the Global Reporting Initiative and Integrated Reporting. So it is absolutely not true when we are told there is no other way. The metric fixation is here to stay and those who cannot demonstrate value numerically can't prove it at all. In fact, somewhat sluggishly, the world of corporate reporting is going in the opposite direction, acknowledging the role of qualitative narrative, stakeholder consultation and management trustworthiness. These things are often underemphasized and you only have to look at Australian banks to see how the one-eyed pursuit of KPIs has led an important sector to damage and betray its civic mandate. So right now, arts and culture stand at a crossroads in respect of their value. We can either keep on keeping on, producing more numerical data for an ice heap that seems to melt away even as we add to it, or we can stop and think seriously about what we mean about value, to reflect, not just calculate, and then to find words to express our insight. Part of this must be a refusal to talk the so-called language of government, or at least the refusal to talk it all the time, and in such a way that it seems the only effective means of speaking about arts and culture. Finding the right words to describe the inherent value of cultural experience is more important than finding a new data set amenable to regression analysis. These words need to reflect the core purpose of what cultural practitioners and cultural organisations actually do, and not just the external benefits the government believe taxpayers get from them. Having a debate about what arts and culture are actually for in contemporary Australia won't be easy and it won't be uncontentious, but it will reflect the health, heart and hope of the cultural sector far better than truckloads of quantitative data that mean nothing unless the words around it give it voice. Thank you. I will try and digest that. Um, unfortunately, we can't ask Julian questions, um, but we, we can reflect on that and feed that into the Q&A at the end. Our next video speaker is Andrew Turner, who's Deputy, Chair, uh, Deputy Mayor sorry, of Christchurch City Council. And when I talked to him, he was very, very passionate about particularly the small museums and the, the value of them for their communities and he's going to share some of his thoughts with us now. Kinga Monga, Kinga Waka, Kinga Karangatanga, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Tato Katoa. I'm Andrew Turner, Deputy Mayor of Christchurch, and I've been asked to talk for a short time on the role of museums in communities, in particular communities which are in flux or which are experiencing change. Today, I intend to focus on three museums on Banks Peninsula, and I'll make some comments on the way that the Canterbury Museum in Christchurch City has responded to the challenges and opportunities presented by the Christchurch earthquakes. On the peninsula, I'll focus in particular on the museums in Littleton, in Akaroa, 
and on the O'Kane's Bay Maori and Colonial Museum at O'Kane's Bay. As you'll be aware, Christchurch and Banks Peninsula were severely affected by the Canterbury earthquakes of 2010 and 2011. These earthquakes caused a huge amount of damage, with some areas such as the central city and the east of the city much more affected than other areas. The community of Littleton was one of the areas which sustained a huge amount of physical damage, with a large number of significant unreinforced masonry buildings not faring at all well through the earthquakes and subsequently needing to be demolished. One of these significant buildings was the Littleton Museum building on Norwich King. The museum in Littleton was established in 1968 in this council-owned building and was run by the Littleton Historic Museum Society, a group of local volunteers. Due to the demolition of the building, the museum itself is currently closed, but it's fair to say the challenges of the earthquakes, not least the loss of the building and the closure of the museum, has presented opportunities for the museum that would not have been able to be realized in more normal times. The loss of the museum building and subsequent high profile recovery of the artifacts from the museum by the local fire brigade, in itself an opportunity for community collaboration, generated more than a small amount of interest in the community, much of it from community members who had probably given the museum little thought in the past. All of a sudden, there was renewed interest in the museum and its collection by the wider community, resulting in a number of new members stepping up to take active roles on the board of the museum society the cataloguing of the collection as it was in storage at the Air Force Museum, and a number of interesting and engaging temporary exhibitions and static displays raising awareness of the museum and its collection, essentially keeping the museum alive. This allowed for renewed levels of community engagement and interest, and saw the museum increasingly become a part of what Littleton people saw as an essential part of the rebuild of their own town centre. This came through loud and clear in community engagement around earthquake recovery and the development of the Littleton Master Plan. The community wanted their museum back as an essential part of the townscape. Eventually plans were worked up for a new building. A number of sites were looked at as possibilities for the museum, with a site on London Street, Littleton's main town centre street, being decided on. The council went through a cons consultation process to gift a parcel of council-owned land to the museum for their new building, with the building to be paid for by fundraising through the museum. Community feedback through the consultation was hugely supportive, both of the re-establishment of the museum and the gifting of the piece of land. The land was gifted, plans for the new building are well underway, and it really resonates with me that one of the first new buildings to be built on London Street will be a community-owned building, a community-owned facility, which will house the valuable Littleton Museum Connect collection, which as an integral part of Littleton heritage, will allow that collection to remain in Littleton where it belongs and to help tell the Littleton story. And that this community-owned building will allow for valuable partnership opportunities with other community organizations and community groups and will provide opportunity and vibrancy right on Littleton's main street being a huge community asset. Placemaking, bringing the community together, adding to Littleton's sense of identity and preserving heritage are all parts of what really is the success story of the Littleton Museum. And without the passion and the involvement of the local community, all of this could easily have been lost. The Akaroa Museum is right in the center of Akaroa. It was established in 1964 and is a key part of the Akaroa townscape consisting of the museum building itself and a collection of other buildings around it, including the old courthouse and an early French settler's cottage and the Akaroa Customs House. It's part of the landscape and amenity of Akaroa, and much like the Littleton Museum, is much loved and well supported by its local community. It's an essential collection of Akaroa and Banks Peninsula artifacts, and it really tells some of the stories of Akaroa and Banks Peninsula. The Frank Worsley story is depicted through an exhibition and draws visitors to Akaroa with a particular interest in Antarctica. The Akaroa Museum was also damaged in the earthquakes and repairs were required. For much of the period after the earthquakes until the repairs were completed, much of the museum was closed. This unfortunately occurred at exactly the same time that Akaroa experienced a surge in the number of visitors as many Christchurch attractions were closed, so visitors were looking for alternatives, 
and at the same time, as because of earthquake damage to the port at Littleton, the 80 or so cruise ships a season which come to Canterbury were diverted to Akaroa, again, dramatically increasing the number of visitors. The Akaroa Museum is a city council facility, but is run by a locally resident manager with local staff and well supported by a community group called the Friends of the Akaroa Museum. Like Littleton, community interest in the museum is strong. It's an essential part of what makes Akaroa, Akaroa. It provides local employment, is a key visitor attraction, and really adds to Akaroa's sense of identity. Despite the museum being a council-owned and run facility, with local staff and with the support of the Friends of the Museum, there's a real sense of local ownership of this museum. Local fundraisers take place, the exhibitions have a real local flavour, and because of the local nature of the, com of the collection, there are many people resident in Akaroa and on wider Banks Peninsula who have a per personal connection with parts of the collection. In terms of its contribution to Akaroa and the changes that have taken place there since the earthquakes, the museum has been a key part of the visitor offering and adds to the quality of welcome for visitors and the sense of pride Akaroa residents have in their own town. It's helped Akaroa cater for its increasing number of visitors in a meaningful way and the fundraising contribution by Akaroa to its own museum, including lobbying council to complete the repairs by providing new cases and displays, have added to Akaroa's sense of ownership of what is really Akaroa's own and very unique museum. Again, bringing the community together, creating that essential sense of ownership and providing a number of benefits both economically and socially to Akaroa. The O'Kane's Bay Maori and Colonial Museum is situated in the small settlement of O'Kane's Bay, one of the remote bays of Banks Peninsula. O'Kane's Bay is one of the last remaining functional residential small communities on the peninsula, with families living in the bay who have been living there for generations. There are three main activities in the bay that provide employment, farming, a local camping ground and the museum and its associated activities. The collection of the museum is made up of local Maori and colonial artefacts. The collection is unique in both its content and in its nature, and the history of the museum itself, established and gifted to the community by the late Murray Thacker, is remarkable. A recent report by Te Papa described the museum's collection as of national significance, and it's also been noted that to preserve the value of the collection, it should remain intact and remain together, and that it also should remain in place at O'Kane's Bay to preserve the local connection and the local significance. The staff of the museum have traditionally occupied a number of houses which are owned by the museum. This has allowed the families of those staff to populate the local school, the effect of which has been to keep the local school open. The museum's facilities include a local grocery store in the bay and a local petrol pump, keeping the community supplied with the essentials which is particularly valuable in this remote location. And again, this is all providing local employment. With large numbers of visitors visiting the camping ground in the summer months, the existence of the camping ground, the shop and the petrol pump have provided opportunities for local enterprise to really benefit economically from these large numbers of visitors. One of the key events in the museum's calendar, in fact in the peninsula's calendar and in the regional calendar, is the legendary Waitangi Day event at O'Kane's Bay. Again, instituted by Murray Thacker and run for many years, the hugely successful Waitangi Day events draw large numbers of people, represent an opportunity for cultural engagement and education, and represent an excellent fundraising opportunity both for the museum and its local community. The board, of which I'm pleased to be one of the members, is made up of local people who are passionate about the museum and everything it does in the community, and who are committed to continuing the dream of Murray Thacker and the legacy of his original work. There's also a Kahui Korowai of community members, community volunteers, who also volunteer at the museum and do a lot of the really valuable work to keep the museum functioning and looking at its best. So in the O'Kane's Bay Museum, we not only have a unique and valuable collection, but an opportunity for community building, social enterprise, economic activity, and social and community development. Without the museum and its associated activities, the community of O'Kane's Bay certainly would not be what it is. 
The museum has definitely been a part of the glue which has held this community together and contributed to, contributed to its sustainability over a long period of time. And the board is very clear in its commitment to the continuation of both the museum and the valuable role that it plays in the O'Kane's Bay community. Finally, I wanted to touch on the role of the Canterbury Museum post-earthquake. With all of the challenges the city and the museum faced and continue to face in the aftermath of the earthquakes, the Quake City exhibition, first established in a building on Cashel Street in the central city and now in a new building on Durham Street, was a remarkable step in the city's journey to recovery, regeneration and in some ways rehabilitation. It's been a great way for visitors to the city to spend a relatively short amount of time experiencing the earthquake and its aftermath to very quickly get up to speed with what Christchurch and Canterbury experienced and what this meant to our communities and what the challenges and opportunities have been and how the city has responded to these. It helps visitors make sense of what they see and experience as they move around the city during other parts of their visit. But just as importantly, maybe even more importantly, local people are able to visit the Quake City exhibition and in many cases this has been helpful in their journey coming to terms with what has happened and their understanding of what they experienced, making sense in some cases of their own particular personal experience in the earthquakes and in their aftermath. So on the face of it, we have an exhibition which will be of interest to visitors to Christchurch who want to learn and experience more about the city. But actually here is an exhibition which has a far wider range of social outcomes and benefits and which has been hugely valuable in assisting the city's recovery and regeneration. So I hope that in this short session today, I've been able to depict some of the benefits museums have to communities beyond the obvious. And how in Christchurch and Banks Peninsula, museums have assisted and continued to assist in creating good community outcomes for communities which have experienced huge challenge and change. Thank you for your time and attention today. It's been a pleasure to be invited to contribute in this way. Norera, tenna koto, tenna koto. Ten Natato Katoa. So it's a great pleasure for me to hand over to Ameria Puea Taylor. Neira te mihi mā manaho, he mihi humari ki a kaito ngā mana finua no kone o o taitahi ki a kaito ngā kaita ki kato o te finua o Aotea Rua. Neira te mihi atu ki a kaito ki te harama e ki te fakaari a reo kaito taringa ki a hau ki a mato ko waio. Am I, am I loud? Oh, yeah, uh, ko wai au, uh, he uri o Ngāti Te Ata Wai o Hua me Ngāti Tipa ki te Puaha o Waikato uh, me te motu o Hāmoa, te motu o Aitataki me Achu, Rarotonga, um, tata ki Taiti Papitsi. Uh, ko a media rangihere runga Parinuko Puya Taylor tōku ingoa, he people weva ahau. Um, feel funny being up here sitting down and talking. Anyway, so um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to Museums Aotearoa for giving me the opportunity to come up here and speak. Um, to those of you who know me, um, I used to work in the museum sector. In my heart, I'm still working as a, in the glam sector, but today I stand here as a person outside of that. Um, a people weaver, it's not a role that's new. In fact, it's very old and I'm just bringing it back with a bit of spunk. Um, in 2014, I had the privilege of being an intern. I worked under the, uh, the guidance and the korowai of my tuakana, Bethany Matai Edmonds, as a youth programmer at Auckland War Memorial Museum, Talamiki Paingahira. And with that, I walked in as an intern with a background of 10 years doing mural arts in Tāmaki Makoto, as well as in the North Island. Um, to this day, I have about 250 murals under my belt. My passion is working with rangatahi, and thankfully, Bethany got pregnant and I took her job as the youth programmer. Um, it's really interesting being here in reflection of my pastimes at the museum. 
Um, I was one of the youngest members to receive a permanent position as the youth programmer, and I was really fortunate to have been there, to have taken the studies of being a project manager and an arts manager. I landed myself with a master's in, with distinction in arts management, and was able to utilise that museum and that whare taonga um, as a place of hood school learning. Where I am today, I am half self-employed, where I run alongside my business partner, Jamie Waititi. We run an amazing little um, rangatahi hub. So put your hand up if you're on Instagram. Put your hand up if you're on Facebook. And put your hand up if you're on Twitter. I'm giving you 30 seconds to please like at the 312 hub. All right. My reason for saying this is because to me that's the, the living museum in my eyes. Everything that you all do and the roles that you play in these organisations and institution, yes, they benefit people, but there's work that exists that people don't know about, like the 312 Hub, that to me is also a living, breathing whare taonga. Um, Jamie and I set up 312 Hub in Onihonga, uh, an abandoned place in Onihonga that um, has a few issues, but we managed to get the place free rent for two years. And what we do is we've created a place where youth lead through community, change, um, culture, and creativity. So this place exists, it's got a gallery, just like every other museum, we've got a gallery. And then downstairs, we also have a creative studio. It's been really interesting to use my role and all the hats I used to wear within the museum and with working with young people across Tāmaki Makoto to be able to do everything I wasn't allowed to do. So I want you to go home tonight and have a look at the 312 Hub and um, everything on there is for free. And it's based on a model of the Whare Tapawha where we incorporate well-being of the mind, physical um, health and safety in my eyes, but also including our whānau and our friends. Um, I never, uh, I'm just going to go a bit off topic a little bit. My reasons for leaving the museum was purely, and it's, I heard it today with the repatriation corridor, someone was saying that um, um, you can feel it, I think it was you, Rachel, you spoke about when you walk into the whare taonga, your body and your tenana can tell you if you're meant to be there. I had to leave the museum because I already knew straight away that my position isn't inside the museum. When we talk about value, and I heard Julian speak of value in a really beautiful way, but I actually can actually, um, I can challenge that. Value is also of your body. Value is also of making sure that you know when you're meant to be in the whare taonga or not. Just like Matua Bobby explaining, the tupuna will tell you when they're ready to come home. My reasons for leaving the museum is because my value doesn't sit within the whare taonga. It's acknowledging that my value is actually at home with my people. Back in Waiuku, it's among the rangatahi, and it's also about being in the spaces where our actual everyday people are here. So I find it very interesting that this year's themes is um, talking about outside insights. When can someone can those of you that don't belong to an institute or work for yourselves, can you raise your hand? Awesome. There's not many of us. To me, the value in these types of spaces is being able to get more of us in these places so that it's not just museum people talking to museum people. In order for me to honour my role as a youth programmer at the museum was to stand outside of it was to get back into the grassroots, was to get next to our, our children in Kura, and to paint murals with them and actually hear 
what do they want to learn? Obviously, majority of children only come into the museum when they are going for school trips. Or when you get into secondary school and tertiary, it's only if you've got a specific um, pathway to wanting to be in the museum for whatever reason. In fact, I think my, re my museum career actually started with my Uncle Dion when he was a kapahaka performer at the museum. And that was my introduction to what the taonga looked like. And my interest grew of reconnecting with those taonga purely because as a kid I was inspired by why are those taonga in there? We've got those back at home, but what's the difference between these ones with lighting and ours that are actually being used for kai? Or ours that are actually being used to house actually kids' shoes? And it's got nothing to do with taking care of it and glorifying it and not being able to touch it. So for context, sitting here as a people weaver outside the museum, as much as the museum space has valued what I do, I find that I'm more valuable to the museum by being outside of it. Luckily for me, my relationship to the museum, I've been able to sit in the space of governance and to sit next to the Taumata Aiwe in a Pacific advisory group and actually give them exactly what the kids in the rangatahi are telling me and being able to critique their strategic planning and go, um, actually, these guys aren't really into it. And funnily enough, I'm being better remunerated for my mātauranga being outside of it as opposed to being in it. And the freedom I have of being able to speak wholeheartedly without feeling like I might, you know, get in trouble here and there. My role now is to be a conduit for those rangatahi. And so when I speak about value, don't forget, while you're looking and manakiing the, those taonga that you have inside the museum, please recognise that in your communities where you all live, in the local marae that you have and in the kura, the tertiary institutions that you all have around you, those are living taonga, and that too also deserves a lot of the value that while you emphasise the needs of taking care of these taonga in-house, make sure that you think of equity and look after those taonga that sit without it. So on that note, I wanted to um, acknowledge a lot of the mahi that you do do behind the scenes. I know that many of us here can see in the room, we've had one-on-one -on -one conversations. The beauty in what you do is that I hope you all go home and check in with your children, check in with your mums and your dads or your kaumātua and your kuia and make sure that their mātauranga is placed into Vernon, but also so that their mātauranga is actually embedded into that taonga because while that taonga sits there in a, in a pressured room, it also needs to have life breathed into it. Is breathed a word? Okay, I'll make it a word. But me sitting on the outside, working at the 312 Hub, every Sunday we run hikui, and we get to walk up Maunga Kieke, where my tupuna hua kaiwaka was once sat in Kiwi Tamaki. And everything that I learnt under Louise Theory, under um, archaeologists such as Ian Lawler, also my rurihi, Naniko Manhanik, everything from all these amazing kaitiaki over the years have given me, I'm now practicing on my every day. Do I get paid for it? Nah, but that's okay. Every Sunday I get to practice what kaitiakitanga looks like on the outside. And while I hope you guys all work your 40 hour weeks or in your fixed term contracts, you make time to work with these existing kaupapa that sit with outside, or outside of it. Because that to me is how we can start those kōrero about, what, how, about repatriation with the community being involved. There's a lot of people, especially in my generation, that are entrepreneurs. They're all starting their own businesses because they're sick of having bosses that don't get it. And so among us in our own little community, we're trying to think of ways digitally, um, physically. A lot of us are also returning back home to our papa kainga, but there is a huge ecology of people that I feel that we all have um, 
an opportunity to collaborate with. Um, and essentially, deep down, I know that we're all people weavers. So my pātai and my tono to all of you is, how many rangatahi can you get under your wing today? How much mātauranga of yours can you pass on to, to them? And when we, talk, when we talk about evidence, how many of you are going to bring them along next year to make sure that while we talk about it amongst ourselves as the museum glam sector, who of you are going to make sure that people go out there and talk about it that sit with outside those whare taonga? Um, nō reira, i ngā mana, i ngā reo, i ngā rauranga mā, kia koutou mā, kia kaha tonu, um, he tino miharu rawa tu taku manoa, a taku hiningaro, um, ki te whakapakere, ki te whakatūwhira i ngā mea kaitiaki. Um, ai, tēnā koutou. Okay, back to the video, and I'm going to introduce Terry Janke, who's a principal of Terry Janke and Company. She's a, a, a legend, highly respected Indigenous lawyer. I wrote that, she didn't write that, by the way. Um, highly respected Indigenous lawyer, businesswoman, and advocate. Uh, she's developed protocols for um, Indigenous pro um, properties and artefacts. She's done a variety of um, Indigenous business law advice. She's been a Businesswoman of the Year. Um, she's worked with the Australia Council for the Arts, and she was appointed a consultant for Museums Galleries Australia's Indigenous Roadmap Project in March 2017. And what she and she also um, has a, a wonderful um, she mentors and employs fantastic groups of um, um, Indigenous. Um, lawyers, um, generally young women, and they're getting a really wonderful go on this project as well. So she's a huge um, mentor um, in so many ways. And I'll talk briefly about the, the project later, but um, Museums Galleries Australia project is for, um, we've got funding for working with Indigenous communities, Indigenous workers, um, uh, uh, museum and gallery workers, non-Indigenous as well, directors, everyone, about how can we better increase participation representation in our museums and galleries around the country, and um, let's develop a 10-year roadmap for change. So, big goals. And so here's Terry and some of her, her workers. Hello, I'm Terry Janke. I'm beaming in from Sydney, Gadigal country. I'm an Indigenous woman, I'm a lawyer, I'm Woodathy and Miriam. My firm, Terry Janke and Company, has been commissioned by Museums Galleries Australia to prepare a Indigenous roadmap for the future of Indigenous engagement with the museums, galleries sector. We're so happy to be working with Alex Marsden and she's been great in leading us in the consultation process. Working on the project are two young Indigenous women, Taryn Saunders and Sarah Grant, and you'll hear from them in this clip. They have been consulting and drafting towards the report and the issues paper and all the things that are the outcomes for this project, and it's been a really good learning experience for them. Hi, I'm Taryn Saunders from the Gunajumara people, and I've been working alongside Terry assisting with the workshops and holding some of the consultations. Uh, extensive consultations has been key to this project. We've met with many people around the country including associations such as the Council of Australian Museum Directors and Indigenous Advisory Committees of Cultural Institutions. We've consulted with over 600 people through face-to-face -face meetings, emails, teleconferences, and we've conducted 13 public workshops across Australia with uh, more workshops to be held. We have prepared a literature review and conducted some surveys and audits of major institutions. The result of all of these are available on our website. So one of the questions we wanted answers for was, where are we now? 
There is a serious misjunct between how museums and galleries represent and engage and how Indigenous people want to be represented and engaged. At the heart of this is a different value system. One is based on a knowledge system that values the object and the other is based on the living culture, the relationships and the processes. Many people we spoke to said that Australia started well in the 90s on their approach to Indigenous participation and engagement in museums. There has been some great work that has come about due to the policies, previous possessions and continuous cultures, including permanent and temporary exhibitions which have, which have set a high standard of representing an Indigenous viewpoint. However, many people felt that this participation and engagement has been inconsistent. There is a sense that this momentum from the 90s has subsided, leaving only a handful of committed players. So, where are we now? What representation and engagement do we currently have? In representation, our audit asked the question, how would you rate Australian museums and galleries in a way that represent Indigenous material? Encouragingly, 40% of respondents said museums and galleries are doing good to excellent. Yet, disturbingly, just under a quarter of respondents felt museums and galleries are performing poor in this area. Representation of Indigenous history must also consist of recognition that this is a history that is often hard to tell. Museums and galleries should be encouraged to embrace these histories, recognising the need for these traumatic stories to be told in order for reconciliation and healing to take place. Now I want to talk a little bit about engagement. How do museums engage with Indigenous people? 26% of museums and galleries rate their engagement with Indigenous people as excellent, with 51% saying fair and 22% saying poor. Museums engage Indigenous people by having wraps, uh, outreach projects, engagement, internships, Indigenous advisory groups, etc. However, in the audit, 85% of Indigenous people said that they wanted a deeper engagement. The consultations gave an indication of what this deeper engagement is. Now to employment. Increasing Indigenous employment in the sector has been a central concern for policy documents over the last 25 years. This is worrying then, that it still remains at the forefront of people's concerns. Our survey suggests that people are right to be concerned. 59% of respondents to our audit report noted that they had no Indigenous staff while 79% in, of museums and galleries recorded having no Indigenous staff at an executive level. The staff that are in museums and galleries do not always feel supported. Cultural safety was a big issue. They have unique roles as being part of the Indigenous community, but working for museums and galleries. Hi, I'm Sarah Grant. I work at Terry Jenkins and Company, and one of my main aspects inside this project was to help create the literature review, help draft the issues paper, do a lot of consultations and help with uh, the running and the organising of the workshops. From the consultations we were able to develop five key elements for change and these are just the starting points for the roadmap which we're going to develop further through further consultations. So the first point is creating culturally safe spaces, the second is two-way caretaking of our treasures, the third being embedding Indigenous engagement into museums and galleries, the fourth point Indigenous opportunities and the fifth connecting communities. So in order to create culturally relevant and safe spaces what we're aiming to do is create welcoming spaces inside museums and galleries for Indigenous people. Cultural safety was recognised as perhaps one of the most significant areas in relation to Indigenous engagement. People said that there would be many benefits stemming from having culturally safe spaces. This would include increased Indigenous employment because Indigenous people would feel safe inside, inside those working environments, increased Indigenous visitors because they would feel safe inside museums and galleries again, and it would also have staff members recognise the value and of representing and engaging with Indigenous peoples. The next step would be creating two-way caretaking for our treasures. Some of the key concerns that were raised in relation to museums and galleries was that they didn't know what was inside their collections. Further, access to these collections was limited and when it happened it was under the museums and galleries circumstances. 
Therefore, there needed to be new practices in place to ensure that Indigenous people had access to these collections in ways that they made them feel comfortable. Proper collection management would also increase Indigenous employment and offer more opportunities for Indigenous people to revitalise culture, to work with their culture again and to be able to understand what has been locked behind doors for hundreds of years. Embedding Indigenous concepts into museums and galleries involves all museums and galleries moving towards creating an environment where Indigenous engagement is at the centre of their practice. Indigenous engagement can occur through commitments such as funding opportunities, exhibitions, reconciliation action plans and policies that are implemented to make sure that when staff are approaching exhibitions they know how to interact with Indigenous communities and how to interact with Indigenous cultural material. Indigenous opportunity meant ensuring that Indigenous staff felt comfortable in their roles. It also meant that Indigenous people were employed in all areas of the organisation. Further, there was opportunity for both younger and older Indigenous people and there was an emphasis on diversity. Indigenous people need to be given executive positions and board opportunities so that there is that upper level of change happening. The final element for change was making sure that communities had a way to connect with museums and galleries. One of the main ways of doing this was ensuring that there were outreach programs, educational opportunities, benefit sharing opportunities. So just to reiterate, the five key elements for change that we're developing are around creating culturally safe spaces, two-way care and taking of our trade, embedding Indigenous engagement, engagement into museums and galleries practices, um, creating Indigenous opportunities and connecting communities. We've spoken to Indigenous people, those working in the sector, conducted surveys mm -hmm. to get a lot of information about how to improve Indigenous engagement in museums and galleries. The roadmap, when it comes out, will need the support of the sector, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people working in, that, in there, both large organisations, small museums and galleries, those in regions and remote areas, to really make a difference. If we are to change the position of Indigenous people in Australia and the historical record and the representation of Indigenous people in museums and galleries, we need to work together. They're good, aren't they? It's been a great pleasure working with them. We'll continue to do so. And I will attempt to answer questions that you might have about uh, the process. So kia ora. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're meeting today and pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and emerging, and to all other Indigenous peoples here today. Kia So, are museums and galleries agents of change? Should they be? And for whom? And I'm going to answer in two ways. Well, I'm going to answer yes, but I'm going to answer yes in two ways. Yes, through museum practice, and yes, through the delegated authority of their membership associations. And I'll end with a challenge. So firstly, yes, through museum practice. Well, firstly, agents of change, I think, through their very own structures, very own colonial inherited, colonial constructed types of museums and galleries that we have. Um, there's been quite a lot of this um, looked at in terms of the, the roadmap we've been working on, um, but other ways as well. So the structures that we have are very, very um, embed the ways in which we think. Um, I was last year at the Commonwealth Association of Museums Training Conference in Calgary. Um, Jane Leggett and Ken Hall, who are here today as well, were, were, were there with me, and it was a huge focus on decolonising um, museums. Uh, front and centre for many historical museums, particularly in the Commonwealth countries. We heard amazing presentations from Namibia, South Africa, Barbados and other ones. Hierarchies as well. Hierarchical structures are incredibly powerful um, in mandating what you can and can't think of or do or experiment with. We also have employment structures. We need to start changing those very significantly, not only for the indigenous that we, we looked at with Terry's work, but for women, for parents, 
um, for Indigenous particularly, in terms of looking at employing people, not, not employing a fantastic Indigenous worker, taking them out of community, making them work in an office from nine to five, employing them in place, things like that. So the concept of the socially engaged museum through its various structures and its evolving structures is a critical one, I think, that challenges and empowers and leads the communities in which they sit. Secondly, museums should be agents of change in their own practices in particular. And we've looked briefly at some of those. We should be looking more at Museum Next looks at those as well. In terms of co-design, in terms of stepping back from positions of authority, in terms of all the prototyping with visitors, with users, sharing power, um, some call it democratising the museum. The ideas of custodianship of collections rather than ownership is a massive one that will continue. And I was saying um, uh, earlier to some people and to the minister earlier after, um, after this first wonderful session today, it's going to be really exciting the next 20 to 50 years how things are fundamentally going to change about um, objects or belongings and who, who, who has custodianship of them. There's also an increased blurring of discipline boundaries and the mixing of media and tools to engage multiple communication styles and spaces and platforms, and that's all to the good. We've got increasing accessibility to and of content, and in particular through digital access to collections, and that's another major project that we're running that I'll mention briefly in a sec. And of course, repatriation is um, a massive, massive way in which we should be agents of change in our own practices. Thirdly, we should be agents of change in terms of influencing our visitors to be agents of change in their own lives and in society. There are things, um, a lot of um, museums and galleries are focused on programs for developing empathy, multiple viewpoints beyond, um, um, beyond the wire. Museums Victoria is a massive one about um, uh, the, the situation of um, refugees on, on Manus and Nauru. The State Library of Victoria has amazing programs training in ethical awareness for school students and using the objects and collections that they have with a deliberate focus for training up ethical awareness. There's voicing your opinion, and I'm just thinking about the Smithsonian, um, uh, looking at um, innovation skill sets, in looking at the history of innovation, but always, always prompting visitors to think about how they innovate in their own lives and what they can do, being change agents there. And at the museum, making noise, make some noise exhibition um, when they focus on the USA's civil rights movement. And they ask the question, what's your cause? And they actively exhort young people to find their own cause and spread the word to be agents of change there. There's um, uh, really interesting work happening about slavery through museums. There's President Lincoln's cottage home for brave ideas, which um, is not just talking about this is where he signed the, the, the declaration, the proclamation to end slavery, but they've got huge programs for um, tackling modern day slavery and bringing um, kids in to work on that, youth parliaments and all the rest of it. Really, really important. Similarly with the Liverpool museums, Liverpool slavery museums. And of course, um, if any of you have not yet seen the National Museum of African American History and Culture, that's one of the most profoundly moving and challenging and most wonderful museums in the world, I think. Didactic and passionate and powerful with numerous calls to action and also a vast space for contemplation and for healing, um, extremely important as well. So back to the main question, uh, museums and galleries, or should they be agents of change? And my second yes answer is yes, through the delegated authority of their membership associations. Um, now, membership associations, I think, have two strands to our identity. Membership, absolutely, and also peak body, industry advisor and advocate. And those two strands absolutely have to and do inform and strengthen each other. The members advise, guide and demand stuff from us, and that's the way it should be. We've recently done a pretty exhaustive strategic review. In fact, we're still in the strategic review of our association for a number of reasons. 
Um, one of the elements of that review has been consulting in as many different ways as possible with our members and external people. And we had a, a membership survey. And the top demand of that, it was a very high proportion of responses to the survey, which is great. The top demand for that was for more visibility and for sector leadership. Some of the themes in that, um, and it's amazing reading to read through, and I've read through every single comment that people wrote in the free text field, really interesting and, and valuable feedback. There's clearly much distress with the piecemeal undervaluing of art and culture and heritage in Australia. And that's not surprising, considering the paucity of both policy and funding, I have to say. There's a desperate need for more and sustained advocacy at every level, at state level, at local government level, at national government level, of public value. There's a desire for networking and information sharing. And through all of that, there is the absolute importance and passion for collaboration to achieve significant change. So I'll just give a few couple of examples. Our modus operandum is um, both behind the scenes and also a lot of vociferous public comment. So first up, just as some examples, is of course the Indigenous 10-year um, Indigenous Roadmap for Change, where we went out and, um, to the um, museum directors of um, Australia and New Zealand, CAMD, Council of Australasia Museum Directors, and said, this is what we want to do. Um, will you support us? And the answer was very strongly yes. Went out to the Council of Australian Art Museum Directors, got incredible support for putting up the proposal for a funding program to do this. And when we had our joint Museums Australasia conference here in Auckland uh, two years ago, we had heard just two days before that we'd actually got the funding. So it was really cool to actually be discussing it there and then. So that's the roadmap which will lead to significant change. And I'm really proud of the work that we're doing in that because that's something that museums association, your museums associations should be doing. We should be doing that sector leadership. We should be developing the guides. We should be stepping out there and enabling that to happen. And um, I'm really pleased we're doing that. We do a lot of submissions on heinous things like efficiency dividends, or um, compounding budget cuts, that's what we should be doing. Lots of direct raising with ministers, lots of articles. We also saw in Australia um, a DARF, there's a DARF, there's no cultural policy to call um, by the name at national level. There's certainly a gap, a vacuum in anything to do with digital access to collections leading a national framework. So it, what we did was went out to our fellow peak bodies in the libraries and the archives and um, historical societies and said, do we share enough to focus on this? Do we share enough in common to focus on this? That was three years ago and the answer was yes, after a long and complex day. And the answer was yes. So we've called Glam Peak, which has been going from strength to strength, got funding, developed case studies, developed a draft and national framework for digital access to collections, doing a whole series of um, workshops around the country focused in regional areas. All that stuff's going up online. I was telling some people yesterday, it's all online for people to use. And I'm really pleased about that, that's stepping up, working with other peak bodies and doing that. And we're also in the mix for national research infrastructure, which sounds boring, but if you think about what the sciences have done in terms of space stations and, and astronomical arrays and all of that, well, we're wanting to set up similar research infrastructure in Australia. And we're in there fighting for that at the moment. I um, just did a press release the day before I came here um, because we're worrying we're gonna miss the boat on that for social sciences and the humanities. And I'm making sure that the collecting institutions are, are right in there and getting some support to provide access. So. I'll end with a challenge to all of us here with this big disconnect between the way a lot of um, our communities love museums and galleries and work with them, but somehow there's a disconnect between the way governments and mainstream media view us. So if we see ourselves as agents of change, how come we can't seem to significantly change or shift government and mainstream media perceptions of our role, of our value, and our impact. Do we need to step up, get more evidence, or do we need to change the narrative? I think we do need to do that. And will you commit to working with your associations to tackle this? Thank you.
Thank you uh, to our in-person and virtual panellists. Uh, so there are three of us. We've got 10 minutes for your burning questions. Um, do we have any? Kia ora, thank you very much for the um, presentations. I've got a question relating to evaluation, actually, from our first speaker. I think many people in the sector that are working hard to um, put strong, you know, uh, to be advocates for value, the value proposition, struggle with this quantitative data mentality, as he said, reductive mentality. But what's the struggle is finding appropriate models and following mm. and finding models that we, as museum and galleries, can use effectively. Can you comment on that? Um, absolutely. There are a range of different models which is really interesting to be looking at. There's culture counts, which is getting quite popular in Australia, and I'm not quite sure whether you use this here. I know the WA Museum is, is using it. There's also really interesting stuff being done by local government, looking at different metrics as well. And I'm just trying to remember the name. I did have someone come um, uh, to talk to us about that um, at Glam Peak. Um, some months ago because they are looking at how developing um, indicators that measure both intrinsic and utilitarian and instrumental value and that's fantastic and I'll certainly make that available um, because it's really, really interesting work. So we certainly understand the need for metrics as well as non-metrics but we actually need to have this, those different ways of doing it. So there are two examples I can think of for you. And, and hopefully this one, which is coming out in the next week or so, which there are some advanced copies of here, will help with that too, because it's, it's adding the narrative to the metrics, mm -hmm. uh, talking about benefits, looking at some of the, the social science research, for instance, but, but trying to put that into some words which you can use. So we're, we're trying. <laughs> Uh, kia ora tātou katoa and I'm Henry Nui Kia Koutou, um, Henry Ata Nicholas from Te Amatu Museum. Um, I just wanted to pose a question um, to Alex in terms of the collaboration for the project. Um, how come it went to a, um, a, lawyer, a lawyer factor or a lawyer business rather than a cultural um, group? Like, for example, for a community worker or a cultural community worker like. Um, a media, you know, a, a, an indigenous cultural worker? Hmm. It actually went to someone who's been working in the cultural space for quite some time and who has huge runs on the board in doing that. Um, it went to someone who's very, very respected in the field of culture around Australia, but it also has a tough mind to, um, not saying that you don't have a tough mind. <laughs> um, so someone who um, has a great track record, great passion, um, what she's doing is um, using, in fact we're using her reputation to attract many people who would not normally have been bothered to be involved or to give of their time. So, um, for example, people we have someone from the Australia Council, the head of Indigenous um, Employment at the Australia Council, on our Indigenous Advisory Group for it, um, who part of the reason why she's there is because we have Terry. Um, we do have an Indigenous Advisory group which has been enormously important and continues to be in terms of collaborating on what we do and how we do it. So Terry was, in our view, the best um, person who um, tended for the work. Kilda. And she is Indigenous, of course, and her whole team. Kia ora. I think some of my um, anxiousness around that is that it could be quite problematic in, in the text that is used and in the... Um, in the way that it's produced back into the community. So it'd be quite good to see the final report to see how those words are translated into community speak because it's, it's quite a different sense rather than you're trying to, I think you're trying to get across the numbers and, and the figures um, which lawyers tend to go towards and the black and white of it but actually it's more of a, 
um, shades of mm. conversations and shades of um, levels of engagement and, and appropriateness and cultural value. Yeah. So it'll be quite interesting to see yeah. the report once it's... Um, Thank you for that. Thank you. No, no, I, I appreciate, I really appreciate that. Um, there was a reference to, and I was speaking earlier about the um, the old protocols that we have, and we're looking at, and and I think there was a comment earlier today about a lot of policies written from the viewpoint of the um, use and convenience of the museums rather than the the communities that, that they're aimed at. Um, so we're looking at. We were originally thinking of rewriting those protocols, but they will be in the same sort of language. So we're thinking now about putting some um, uh, covering things on top of that in terms of this sort of language that, that makes it more um, appropriate, I think. Kia ora tato, it's Dale Bailey from Te Papa. I was quite interested in the remarks you made about the Canadian conference mm. and the shared experience across Commonwealth countries about the need to decolonise museum practice. And then also to hear the comment that um, our panellist here thought she could do more work by being outside the institution than within. And I'm just wondering whether there's any sort of uh, insights emerging around how we shift mindsets in the hierarchy and the professional practice of museums. Maria, to answer that's a big question. Um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, I have agency of sitting inside the museums. Also, my track record as an artist um, enables me to have a sense of status within those spaces. And so, unfortunately, my actions speak louder than my words. And so that's a really good um, outcome for museums, the flip side that kind of gives me agency too is that I was raised on the papakainga. So next to my, my, my kaumato and my kuya and my elders, they know where I've been, they know that I sit inside the CBD of Auckland City. And so it's about finding the right people weavers in your institutions. It's about acknowledging those community stakeholders that are doing the do and working with them, support them in their kaupapa, but it's a double-edged sword where you benefit. You may be putting into them and you may be working alongside them in their, their creative practice. Um, you know, for the likes of someone like the RGBQTI um, collective, Fafswag, they were my homies in Otara when I was a student at MIT. Their come up has been amazing over the last two to three years. Now everyone wants them, and now they're coming to us. So it's, it's, in our community we call it, it's like a pass, you know. So it's about all these people that you have within your institutions. Um, I think those that work in public experience, and I think it actually goes across the board. Um, for example, our science departments, Go back to your old tertiary providers and connect with the next class. Give a talk there. Give back. Because there's going to be one or two students that are going to come back to you and pick your brains. And then it actually becomes a, a reciprocation. Once you've got that, that's the kind of stuff that changes the hierarchy. Most importantly, if you have power, mana, to put our, in advance our rangatahi into places of governance, that there is the catalyst of change. If you get our people that sit with outside of the museums into those decision-making spaces, you actually help the museum trickle the information up and down, and it breaks the hierarchy. That's my ultimate goal in life, but anyway. I think unless anybody's got any other burning questions on that note, it's a good place to stop. Uh, so please join me in thanking our panellists. And, and I think the, the takeaway is that uh, we will all gain if we share that authority and uh, we will all be able to be agents of change. Thank you. <laughs>